I'm, I'm a learner, so probably by the end of this presentation you see how ignorant healthcare providers are. As a clinical pharmacologist, which actually, for some people don't know what stats really long, it's a subspecialty for medicine, which is deals with the relationship between the human body and medications. Um, it's a kind of fascinating because I did oncology before that, and, and people consider it stupid for you to leave the oncology in a very wealthy environment and go for clinical pharmacology. But unfortunately, because what I've observed in my career in medicine is that no one actually closes the gap between understanding what medications are and how can we use them rightly. These days, there's something I've been passionate about for the past five years so called individualized medicine. In other words, if 325 milligram aspirin can show you a pain, the next door person may need only 100 milligram. Our body is quite biological. In other words, you have to deal with each and every individual in a separate scenario. That's why when it comes to the cannabis, <coughs> one single bad experience, unfortunately, may generalize the belief that actually it's bad. But what about the 99 people who have no issues about that? It's so great to pick up the wrong things, but it's so pathetic to glorify when things go right. So, first of all, I just want to make a disclaimer that I don't have any conflict of interest, including joints or gestures or anything. Um, <laughs> I want to ask the audience one thing. Um, I just want to give you a moment to look at these numbers. These are not the next winning global numbers, guys. Um, but this one reminds you of something. Anyone knows what 03121967 means? It's a date. It's a birthday. Congratulations. Uh, the Julian birthday was yesterday, so happy birthday, Julian. Thank you. <laughs> so it's a date. That's right. Date means, I have to elaborate, date means in Canada, because there's a date as a Canada and there's a date as a fruit. So this is the date in the Canada. Does <laughs> anyone know what happens in South Africa on September the 3rd, 1967? We haven't had a moon landing here. And I've asked the medical school, I go to all of these primary schools, because my children sit in the primary school, and there's this campaign called Know Your Drugs. And I asked these children, do you know this? And then I showed, I showed them a picture of Justin Bieber. I said, who is that? And all of them knows who is the Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber. But this is, this is when we are ignorant, because I'm not South African, but I have the privilege to work at Curtis Steel Hospital. And, and this is exactly when Christian Bernard executed the first human-to-human heart, -human heart transplant. And why am I bringing this thing? Why this one specifically? Because when Christian Bernard executed that operation by the patient whose name uh, Washkansky, He's been criticized five days later by all the ethics society. In fact, they called him the misleader because he told the patient's family there's a chance, 80% chance of success of this first heart transplant. And we have a conversation yesterday with one of my colleagues when she said that there's a difference between you tell someone there's 80% chance of success or 20% chance of failure. But here's the biggest problem. I had the privilege, to be honest, to be to have my own documentary on Al Jazeera, still in Arabic, but because I study in that room, and in Fortescue, if you know it, there's no air conditioning. So for me to study during the summertime of Cape Town, I know the owner of the Cave of the Heart Museum, and I always go there, sitting in front of that, you know, many cane of Christian Bernard. And there is this tiny note, okay, and this has actually changed everything in my life, is when Christian Bernard being criticized that he's a misleader, and mislead the family by giving them the false hope, despite the fact that the patient died 18 days because of the side effect of the drug that prevents the heart to get rejected by the body. He wrote a note, and he said, for a dying man, it's not a difficult decision to convince them to take the operation. But here's a catchy line. He said, if, if you are chased by a lion to the river of a bank, or to the bank of the river, filled with crocodiles, you will leap into the water, convinced that you have a chance to swim to the other safe side. And again, if you just kind of process that kind of belief that how many of us are helpless? I, I joined this kind of cannabis society for one reason, because there's lots of patients came to my clinic and said, well, bro, is it working? I said, I have no idea. Yeah, but you know what? I've tried all the oxycodone, tramadol, everything, and it didn't work. But I'm trying to start a CBD oil. For me, CBD oil, CBD is the location in the city when you can go to get down and down. You know, I mean, I learned English quite late in the States, so, you know, I'm a self-taught English educator. Uh, the biggest problem here is that I started to just take it and ask the patient, okay, give me more information. I'm happy because I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. And amazingly, I've got lots of feedback. Some of them are good, 
Some of them said it didn't change anything. Some people said, well, it makes me quite lulu. Lots of patient people said we smoke it every day. I had grown a society when I studied medical school. Don't make this look fool you. I used to play in a heavy metal fan. We play cover from Metallica, Megadeth, Pantera, Pan and, <laughs> and all my people who play, I used to be the lead guitar. And they said, don't you smoke? I said, I don't smoke for a reason, not for the religion, but I don't want to smoke. And people always say when we smoke, we can hear the music inside. Okay, so there's lots of journeys for someone to determine what's going on. Now, I would like to thank you guys and thank every single person who was in Cape Town. Because my first presentation I did in Cape Town, it was the start for me getting that award from the, the World Congress of Pharmacology and Toxicology, when actually I start to provide an approach how to actually introduce clinical research for cannabis. So this is not my achievement, this is each and everyone sitting inside the room. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so here is the thing. I mean, I start teaching myself. Okay, let's just start at the beginning. Let's see if the the plant has any rules. I mean, when I go to the market, I see lots of people said CBD and said sativa, and you got the other couple said the THC and said indica. Okay, and now look. Okay, fantastic. Like when you buy this different, like the different one, orange, I mean grapefruit and orange. Okay. That one is a really strong, a big, the other one is tiny, sweet. But we find the fact that there's even species in the market that actually can tell you these are below the sativa, these one are below to the indica, and there's the belief that the sativa is the one rich in the CBD and the indica rich in the THC. But when I chat to one of the colleagues and, um, who's actually a fantastic psychiatrist and neurologist and a cannabis researcher, Dr. Ethan Rosso, he has an absolutely stunning information. In fact, this is what blows me up. There is lots of information and resources available, but no one keeps to go and study them. Dr. Rosso has a, a, a specific article where he said the clinical effects of cannabis, clinical structure, have nothing to do whether the plant is tall or short. In other words, the sativa may not sedate you and the indica may not uplift you. And here is the proof. We have this one from leafy.com and you can see that they look at the average CBD content versus average THC content in the different kind of species, including the indica, the sativa, and also the hybrid one. The one actually have the mix 50-50. And you can see it's crystal clear that whether you're using sativa or using the indica, you may not forecast whether you're going to have a CBD or THC. It's a plant. It's a biological system like the human. I'm a doctor, but there's no guarantee that my little boy won't be a computer engineer. You can't forecast since the doctor, the parent has medical care, the children have to be medical care. It's a quite a biological system. And again, what's the verdict? What is the effect predictor? And I was completely ignorant when I always said, okay, it's all about CBD and THC. Then you start looking at the journey that you can see here, Donald Trump is here, there's no BBC or Skinner, so this is not a fake news, guys. You can see CBD, CBH, in fact, there's a huge difference in two points, the CBG and the CBN, I'll see it here. This is the count of, the, this is how the cannabis um, um, biochemistry is quite complex. And to just put a frame on it, there's lots of medication kept in the market. I can't tell anyone, what is Viagra? It's a medication a man has to use to in, to in order to enhance their sexual performance. What if I tell you that the Viagra, the Saldenafil, came to the market as an anti-hypertensive medication for people who suffer from angina victoris? But during the clinical trial, an intern, not a researcher, not a professor, an intern, observed that all genes in that clinical trial wake up with a sweet dream. And because there's so many medications to treat high blood pressure, there was an opportunity to introduce Viagra as a sexual enhancing drug for diabetes. In other words, no one was told that a side effect could be turned into a clinical <coughs> indication. Now, if you go to the Eastern Cape and you go to the ATM, you have one less than 1% chance for someone to put a gun and steal your money. But if you go to the public hospital for the ARB clinic, they will steal your medication. Because one drug in particular, ephedrine, is psychoactive. It's all drug addict take it, mix it with cocaine to make the patient feeling high, hence get more customers. These people more, knows more biochemistry and pharmacology than myself. So there's no predictor. 
The other thing which is also annoys me when people talk about the leaf, you know, like people talking about, I always, my mom, my late mom, she passed away in December last year, she always asked me to wash the orange and eat it with the skin. She has a belief, no sign will prove that, but she thinks the vitamin C actually preserves inside the fruit and in the skin as well. We always tend to discount the turbines, and that's when I quite pessimistic regarding the medical industry synthesizing or, I mean, producing cannabis. Because you're going to look at the pure version of the cannabis. You know what's the worst thing as a clinician I'm believing on? The clinical trial. You know what is it? Clinical trial is you try to take a sample size of the population, 100 people. You make a very sterile environment. You take no medications, no comorbidities, no disease healthy, between 18 and 55, no pregnant women, you take the elite and you try the new drug. But in reality, we try drug from patient having Parkinson, someone is obese. So in other words, they said, okay, if the results from this clinical trial is great, this sample should have represent the general population. I'm sorry, that's not. You sterilize your sample. That's why when it comes to the cannabis, you have to treat the whole plant, the leaves, and the turbines. And this is the reason here. The turbines, we have lots of them. I'm sure most of you knows more than what I know about the turbine oil, the lemon. In fact, the kif, the one actually used by Morocco, is crushed turbines. And the turbines, they give you two things. They distinct the smell, but also have uplifted. I use cinnamon in my coffee when I used to drink coffee. And I feel always quite energetic. And when I ask people why, only Sangoma told me because it uplifts the mood. I don't find that in the medical literature because this is not something they will teach you in your medical school. They will teach you in the medical school to be the man who's wearing the white coat, you have an ego, and you are always right. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the dominant recipe? Okay, that is the biggest question here. Should we go for the THC dominant? Should we go for the CBD dominant? There is always pros and cons for each. The THC is a potent effect, that's why people always refer to the psychoactive effect of it. It's more energetic property, that's why most of the THC-based resources goes towards pain management, like fibromyalgia, or patient with a cancer chemotherapy, specifically the metastatic cancer. There's lots of adverse effects, this is a questionable, because no one has real study to tell you if there's an adverse effect or not. And it's quite ironic. If you look at the leaflet, they call them undesirable effect. If you look at the package insert, they call them adverse effect. If you look at the medical literature, they call side effect. But in the clinical trial, we call them adverse events. You know why? Because events, it may or may not directly relate to your drug. If I smoke weed and I drive my car and my wife phones me, and I, you know, when your wife phones you, two people you have to answer the phone, SARS and your wife. <laughs> And actually, I will get distracted by that, by that phone call and I make a car accident. Whom to blame? My wife, my weed, or the, me using the phone while I'm driving? They will pick up the weed because this is the big stigma. We know about it. This is the biggest problem. When someone walks to my room in the clinic, I don't judge the, the kind of shoes they're wearing, the clothing. If he's a gardener or he's the CEO of the FMB, they should be the same. But unfortunately, if I drive my Ferrari, and I did that trial before, I rented Ferrari in India, you will have a VIP spot park in the hotel. But if you're driving a Tata, they will ask you to go to the back parking. <laughs> because you don't look fit in the whole society that they need to be accepted there. So here's more version about it, why people always come to There's a huge detail, I will make this presentation available to you guys. But there's a huge conflict, and that's when people talk about the balance. That's my biggest problem. How can you guarantee what you're going to have is balance? If you buy the watermelon at the beginning of the summer, it's completely tasteless. If you buy it at the end of the summer season, it's a little bit ripened and too much ripened, and it doesn't give the uplifting. There is, it might be that the science, the industry may answer that, which is people are not interested in this one, specifically pharmaceutical industry. My biggest concern is that the balanced version may have no or may not reflect the actual THC and CBD that we need to aim if we need to push forward to have a CBD as a medical resources. This is not Harrison Ford or Tommy and Jones, The Fugitive, which is one of my favorite movies, but this is the kind of things. People do classify the cannabis into the indica, the sativa base, and hybrid. One of them is we need to be proud about the Durban poison. And that's why I get this one from Leafly, and you look at these chemical structure of the Durban poison, for instance. They have lots of terminal oil, which
which is an important stuff that we need to have inside. It has a higher concentration of THC than CBD. But is that true? What if I planted the Durban poison during the winter time? Would the species be different? What if there is a kind of infestation in the soil when there's lots of nutrients haven't managed to go inside the plant? We would have a more CBD. Maybe we're going to have like you know, parsley or coriander. We don't know. But the fact that in South Africa, I was in the state, and people always talk about ACDC there, or the Charlotte web, but Durban poison was one of the main products that's been highlighting there. Back to the Dutch couple, this is a quiet opportunity that instead of keep growing, why don't you just take a one step and just look what do we have at the moment, and how can we make the best out of what we currently have? Because there, there is no room for a new cell phone device. iPhone is already there, Samsung is already there, Huawei is prime in and it. So, the, what kills me, like, people want to invent something new because it's great for the business. No, there is lots, there is enough available. Try to use these resources. I've contacted six people before, and literally speaking, they come to me. Well, if I contact the dean of the university, I have to wait for three months. But now, when I contacted them, so it's like the military <coughs> brokers, they came to my office and said, we can help because I wanted Samson to start to study the research in cannabis. So again, there is a big, massive opportunity to investigate whether or not the THC is the uplifter, the THC is the psychoactive, the THC is bad. In my clinical expertise, you need to drink more. You need to have some element of THC, some element of the CBD, and some element of terbines for you to withstand the test. Now, if the research couldn't answer, couldn't answer the question, then maybe the lab is. I'm not a lab, I'm not a chemist. But when I look at Washington DCs, um, the, some investigation, they collected these data from three, ten different random labs. And they looked at lots of different species. If you just need to really focus on this ACDC here, I'm just trying to zoom it a little bit. I'm going to see it in the next slide. So the ACDC actually says it has THC of 0.8%, CBD of 16.5. Okay, that's the pooled data. This is how the sign can fool you. Now, what if you take randomly? That's why randomization is a standard of care if you want to do the, your randomized controlled trial. In other words, you need to eliminate the chance. Let's take a random sample. And I took two random samples, and guess what happened? In one lab assay, it shows that CBD is 19, THC 26, more or less similar to the pooled data. But in one random sample, it actually the concentration of CBD was almost 50%, and the THC was almost seven times. How can we explain that? Simple. We don't need PhD for that. What we need to understand is that number one, there might be a different in the speeches. If you get that plant from the master's institutions, it will be different from one from the back of the Stephen Bush University. That climate is different. If you plant it in the northern hemisphere, it could be different than the, the southern hemisphere. But here is the catch. There is no standard assay. People talk about the COA, the certificate of analysis. That's a killer. If you send the same sample, I did that with a urine sample. In, during, during my time when I worked as a GP in Libya, I've had the suspicions that there's a laboratory <coughs> surface that's completely you know, falsifying results because you send him a sample now, he will give you the sample in less than five minutes. There's no way. I'm not a technician, but when I asked people, they said to run the sample paper from 15 to 20 minutes. So what I did that day, it's illegal because there's no ethical, I sent them two different samples from the very same patient from the same time under two different names. And guess what? The first sample came clear, the second sample came a severe status of UTI. If you we in the same container and you send the two samples and one of them come that we have to treat you for the urinary tract infection, how could you explain that? Because there's no standardized system. And unfortunately, what is the science? The science is actually putting some works behind the doors and then reflecting those on publication because in South Africa, for example, if I publish an article, my university will get 150,000 rand. Then the university will top slice 50,000 rand, the, the faculty will take 100,000 rand. Then the faculty will take 75,000 rand and the school will take 25,000 rand. Then the, the school will take 20,000 rand and the department will take 10,000 rand. Then the department will take 6,000 rand out of 4,000 rand. Yeah. <laughs> this is how it works. And if you don't publish, you don't know nothing. No one. I was forced to do five publications a year because this is how the academic and the professor has to be. 
So there is a huge rushing urge to publish more, because the more you publish, the more your ranking goes up. The more your ranking goes up, the more students will come to your institution, more student, more money. You know what I'm going with this whole conversation. So this is the it's a money driven. Now, do we have a roadmap? Each and every single person sitting in this room have their own version of the roadmap. The roadmap is not something you sign in Geneva, or you sign in New York. It's something that you get the people together, ask them, what do you need? When you sit in a restaurant as a group, no one will say, okay, all of you pizza, all of you pollo. He will ask you, what's your order said? What do you drink? What do you prefer? Salt, maybe chips or salad on the side. The roadmap has to be multidisciplinary vision. Include every single human, including children. Because we do this them. Today, my eldest is 11. In six years time, she will be almost out. So we need to understand the vision from different angles. Here's my simple vision about the roadmap. Number one, I'm talking about the clinical side, and that's what I'm talking about the pharmaceutical industry. If you want to really nail this one down, and you want to help, not to create business, you help. You need to identify your active ingredient. And I'm there, I'm there anyone to identify it. Because active ingredient is quite complex. We're dealing with a biological system that changes every second as we talk. If you check the plant in the early morning at 6 a.m., you may find different concentration at 10 a.m. This is how the plant. This is why the chloroform started. This is why the hibernation happens in the animal. There's a biological system you have to admire. Number two, you have to identify a potential indication. I don't like the word that cannabis for all. Now, if you want to smoke marijuana, that's fine for everything. That's what they call a good well being. I know that my late late grandfather used to drink vitamin C every morning. That's his belief. My late father used to smoke three cigarettes, one at breakfast, one in the lunch, one at dinner. That's your, 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 your recipe. I drink hot chocolate, that's my belief. But if you want to do an indication, then you have to find the platform to support that. For me, the main indication that you need to invest on or to concentrate on is the three categories. Epilepsy in children, post-traumatic stress disorder, metastatic cancer when come to the THCRH1, and a chronic pain like peripheral neuropathy and myalgia. We have the signs. I've currently visited a publication that we've been shown that the CBD-rich oil is actually stimulating the 5-HT1, 5 hydroxytryptamine, which is mean the serotonin, the happiness hormone. Exactly what the SSRI, SNRI, and the Prozac does to your body. If these medications can release the serotonin, aka the happiness hormone, it means there's a science support the fact why people would like use for the post-traumatic stress disorder. But we need to dig deeper because one element we call anecdotal evidence. It means it doesn't rank higher in the hierarchy of the evidence-based medicine. Now, the next one is talking about clinical trials. And again, you have to be so careful. I've got the privilege to be called the African PI, because I mean the primary investigator, I'm the only one available here. I mean, I can execute any clinical trial in the side I prefer. However, here's the biggest problem. Here's my main quality. If you want to execute a research in cannabis, number one, you need to have a better cannabis understanding, or cannabinoid understanding. You need to talk to the people who grow it, the biologists, the farmers, the activists, the lawyers, we need to understand what do we have and how can we execute the best out of that. Number two, you have to generalize the results. It means how can we make sure that the, the results are generalized. My first PhD, I did it called pharmacogenetics. It means in each and every single human, we are different from inside. That's why if someone has a drug thinning medication like warfarin, he may take five milligrams, she may take two, two. Because if she take five, she bleed to death. To death. If he took two, he's going to clog and going to die. Why? Because our enzymes in the liver are completely set differently. We knew that. If you give a Chinese person a small sip of alcohol, he will completely lose it. Because we call the slow acetylators. They don't have enough enzyme to break out alcohol. They get flushes in the face, they get oriented, they get completely confused. That's a pharmacogenetics. But that's the way. That's the only way when you can generalize the results. Other than that, you have in South Africa, you get African, you get Indian, you get European. We are different from inside. So we have to make sure that we take that right. Number three, we have to eliminate the placebo effect. What is the placebo? This is the funniest thing. If you look at the clinical trial, they say there's drug A and the standard of care. And the drug A makes 50% and standard of care makes 20%. So we are 50%. No, you are only 30%. Because those 20% is the, the placebo, if I give you, a dummy drug. You know what's placebo? It gives you an empty shell. And we've seen clinical trials. The last one I've done with clobidogrel, one of the antiplated drugs, the placebo group at 18%, the active drug at 31%. So what's the difference? 
12. Then how come an empty capsule make an effect? Hemophysiology. <coughs> what really acts to water? People convinced that actually they took the wanted drug, not taking the dummy drug, because completely blinded. No one actually has to. And it's ironically, we call it blinding. In the UK and British system in pharmacology used to call them masking. And I wrote to them in 2011 and I said, you can't call them masking clinical trial, you call them blinding. Because masking like zero, you can still see who's taking what's going on and what's going back. You need to actually know what you sign up for. I always thought I would never get fooled in my life until earlier this year my son fooled me. He's just nine, he said, Daddy, I got you on a birthday present. I said, what's that? Right, man? He said, I got you an iPad. I told my wife, yeah, did you give him money? He said, no. Is he stealing? No. So how? He said, Daddy, tomorrow I'm going to give you an iPad. I said, is it my old iPad and you clean it and you look at it? It's a brand new sealed iPad. He said, tomorrow morning you will find it under your pillow. I wake up in the morning, there is an iPad under my pillow. And he wasn't lying, there is an iPad. <laughs> it says iPad, it's an iPad. So you need to realize that actually sometimes verbal commitment might not be true. You have to write everything down. You have to know what you have signed for. <laughs> Safety and efficacy again. It's a lots of legal concept. If something goes wrong, it might be overdose. I, Julian can back me up, but you can smoke up to what? 1,000 kilograms? It's 162 kilograms in 15 minutes. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> but what if there is pesticides there? What if a person taking a medication that Cannabis actually may slow the release of those medications. So there is safety concern. That's why this is the irony. This is the best thing. How many times you go to the, ph the, the, the doctor or the pharmacist and they will tell you, take your medication after food? Okay, so we give good advice, right? But why don't we ask them, please, if you smoke or something, just make sure you don't take them with those whatever you use in your life because we have no knowledge. They will never admit that. We try to be always the holy people who understand everything. You know, that's why the politicians and physicians both share the first letter. <laughs> Before the last, we gain the healthcare trust. I have colleagues in my institution when they don't see patient, if the patient admit he or she taking cannabis, it's unethical. If you look at HPC, it's a code of conduct. This patient's right. You have the right to guide the patient. I've never told one of my, you can go, I can give you all the list of my, I've never ever told my patient quit smoking. You know what? In Pennsylvania, when I did my US the exams there, one young, old, I mean, middle aged lady told me a listen. She told me, Doc, this is my antidepressant. If I quit smoking, I'm going to hang myself tomorrow. So I know what smoking is going to do to my body. This is my body, this is my container, do your job. And again, this is, a big, this, is the, this is the wake up call that we need to understand. That how many interference with her? I'm sorry, I can tell you there's about this nasty publication, they don't want to publish it, but I do have original draft. Almost 22% of the healthcare providers in America watching pornography. Okay, no one will talk about that. How many people start closing the door, no one sees me, let me go to the X hamster, whatever it is, and do it? I'm sorry, but that's the fun. The main place <laughs> traditionally. The main place traditionally people go to smoke when they are young is the toilet. It's hiding from the public because it's stigmatized. In my country, if you used to smoke, they will hit you. I grew up in a society where you see someone having a tattoo, he just came out of the prison. Today, tattoo is a fashion thing. So how can you convince the society that what we've been doing for decades is not right? How many people told the Nazi regime that they've been doing to the Jewish population was wrong? Everyone was watching. Oh, because they have the power at that time. But when the power goes off, everyone is standing. You're going to see it. The stigma of cannabis would be in our favor. Benzedrine is the one that the Nazi regime used to give to the airplanes. Now, benzedrine evolved to the anaerobe, which is the amphetamine. From amphetamine becomes methylphenidate. Now, methylphenidate is a killer. If I have to tell a patient to stop something for the kid, it's the retinin and concerta. High blood pressure, high suicide ideation, growth retardation. I've got a lady who injecting a young boy, nine years old, with this testosterone because he's so shorter. <laughs> the problem that it's not his shoulder, he's the written and he's been consuming every day. Jesus. Why? Because he has an ADHD. H for what? For hyperactivity. Every child is a hyperactive by nature. Mm. Only when there's a burden that child cannot actually execute education academically bad because of the attention deficit. Don't do it and they do it again. Maybe because it's quite magic, you know? And if you beat the child, they will do it behind you. 
But the fact is that there's lots of pathology that might look like ADHD. In fact, it's not. Ask any healthcare provider. I do that a lot. I always try to tease my people by sending them to survey monkey. How many times do you allow your child to watch a TV? They said two hours, five hours, six hours. Why? Because we're so busy. Busy in what? If you're busy, give your child a tablet to play with. If you're busy, just switch on into the cartoon, you know, folder in your Netflix. But the fact is that have you had a time to sit and read to your child? My little one, she's seven, I read for her every night. Even when I was here last night, I have to record her in WhatsApp and I send it to her. Because this is the kind of attitude you have to. If you don't come closer together to your family, they will abandon you. They will refuse to listen to you. And in them, oh, this is an ADHD. Congratulations. This is not a pregnancy test, you know. <laughs> and the, one of the most important things, thank you for mentioning that earlier, is that I created a campaign. I thought I'm going to be, okay, let me try to understand if my society knows about cannabis. So I, I created this called EduCan, which is talking about educating healthcare providers only about the science. I'm not talking about smoking plants, receptor based, neurotransmission based, potential indication. I start with three people a nurse, a doctor, and a physiotherapist. Sorry, physiotherapist. Okay? And three months later, we finished 97. Now, for 2020, I've got 700 plus waiting. I mean, people are keen to understand. People are keen to learn. Just how you deliver it. Unfortunately, when it comes to health society, you have to be from that angle. Before, if you are a pharmacist, you can't teach a doctor. If you are a nurse, you can't teach a pharmacist. There's a kind of grading system. So to break the ice, you need to speak to the right people to deliver them. Now, with a clinical trial, what's the biggest problem? This is what I see in South Africa is going to be the challenge. There's a three big acts in South Africa actually clashing with each other. The first one is the SAPRA ECC, the medicine and related substance. The second one is like the America. If in order to do clinical trial, you don't need to have the approval from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. You have to get an approval from the DEA. In South Africa, you're going to see the Drug and Drug Trafficking Act, and have lots of people say, no, 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 no. You can't have it because what if the patient becomes addicted? Then you have other acts for the Criminal Procedure Act 1977. Someone has to wipe all these up, come up with a new framework. These one, if you look at how they are retarded. This one is 65, 92, 77. This is almost 2020. That's why this is the biggest concern, why there's so much delay at the SAPRA, because whoever wrote those kind of amendments, they never ever considered what's going to happen. They never expected the fact that the cannabis would be so demanded that people would request it to become legal in South Africa, not only in the pharmacy, but also in the Woolworths next to the Parsley and Korea. Now, here is the biggest, here is when the healthcare society had insulted the injury. And again, I can't blame that because people try to take one snap from here, one snap from there. There's lots of publications, okay? But having an article to tell you cannabis is great for epilepsy is not enough. Because if you look at those data, and I did, almost 1,732 or 33 publications, most of them coming up with more or less the same statement. Due to the large variety of substances investigated, the varying rules of intake, differences in doses and time, make it difficult to compare data. Because one study in Thailand, one study in India, one study in Russia, one study in, in Kwasulu Natal, there is no uniform. We have a need to multi-center trial and try to look in the same time in one simple angle. You want to have a children with epilepsy, you go there. But you can't take a children with epilepsy and you try to generalize that come outcomes and it may work for an anxiety. Then you look at an anxiety and say it may work for pain management. You have to find the actual information to back up your scientific argument. Now, here's the one I've chatted of the, of the records now with a couple of the colleagues here, that any institution in the world, this is the 99% main recommended textbook in the internationally, in any medical schools, to study pharmacology, called Physic and Clinical Pharmacology. It used to be Cadzol and Trevor, they have this agreement, so this edition only Cadzol sitting there. I wrote to Trevor two years ago, you know what, because I used to teach this topic called CNS Pharmacology or Psychopharmacology. And one of my main lectures I used to do it at UCT, now at VETS, is talk about substance use disorder. People call them drug abuse, that's wrong. It's substance use disorder because what happens in your body is a biological system. The person should not be blamed for that. In this chapter, there's about 15 drugs, okay? It means the bad drugs. So you've got the opioids like tramadol, oxycodone, morphine. 
You've got a CNS steroid like a cocaine and amphetamine, methamphetamine like ecstasy. You've got the nicotine, people are about smoking. You've got about alcohol and how to manage alcohol with a drone. You've got all these nasty things. And this book is beautiful because when you study high blood pressure, they will start with the case. They will give you 55 years old, the patient, he'd been having a headache, he'd been having a blood pressure, he went to the GP, and the GP diagnosed him with blood pressure because his diagnosis, the historic blood pressure was 130. And then give you a couple of examples, and then when you finish the chapter, they will give you the answer. Out of all these kind of a dreadful substance of abuse, guess what this, this book has been keep doing for the past 14 editions? Talking about the young parent walked into the room of that child, and the child was found staring at the ceiling and visibly frightened. If I watch a Game of Thrones, I would have that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, this book this is a, is a clinical book. It should have vital signs, laboratory essay. This should have been 55 years old, being brought from the nightclub. He had a high blood pressure of all day, of 130, temperature of 40 degrees, pulse rate of 110, respiratory rate of 22, and now he's been suspected to have a cocaine. Beautiful case. And he's like, now, this is the whole scenario. Now, look, I'm not going to read all these, but just look at the answers there. There's a statement said, the fact, here's the, here's the catch, is why probably not fulfilling the criteria for addiction at the present. The patient is at risk as epidemiological, epidemiological study. It means no evidence base show that <laughs> drug abuse typically begin in the late adolescence. You know what they refer to? Drug way through. You know, the gateway through drug. That means today he's smoking weed tomorrow. Okay, today he's smoking weed tomorrow. I used to play guitar. I have a King V, red one, customized. My wife told me, me or her, so I said, I have to divorce my guitar. <laughs> I don't wear like a elastic leather, uh, leather pants. I don't actually put in tattoos, but I love rock music. So don't judge the package. This is the kind of pathetic. I wrote to them, I can't actually put in context their response. This was completely unprofessional. There's a confidentiality in the top of the email, so I can't share that, but it's a quite ignorant. You know, when ignorance and arrogance go hand in hand, this is exactly what the health society is quite reluctant to accept this fact. Now, having talked about that, this is my version. This is when I went to talk to Kayo in Japan about a few weeks ago, talking about what will be the main entry. To me, drug addiction is a problem. Okay? I'm talking about recreational drugs in South Africa and Africa. And I think everyone was talking about that. It's even that, that leading case in the textbook talk about the gateway in. What about cannabis as a gateway out? You want me to convince you? I can't convince you. What, to give, what do we give for someone who has a heroin addiction? We give them methadone, which is a weak version of the heroin. It's an agonist. Agonist means activates the receptor. Or bloody expensive medication called propinorphin. And now because propinorphin could be agonist and antagonist, meaning it could have blocked the receptor, what they do, they mix it with the antagonist called naltrexone, called suboxone. It's the drug number one prescribed in Turkey. Okay, people, because you get the poison, you get the exit. Now, what if you start a patient taking the cannabis and avoid them because you fight fire with fire? You don't need them to stop opioid, but you actually treat them with opioid. I love the Netherlands. I love the Netherlands because what they treat heroin with heroin. Right. But they can also clear retractile needles. It means when you push it, it doesn't go back, so no one can use them. You know what happened in the Netherlands? Crime rates down because no one will kill his granny to get the 30 bucks to buy that stuff. Infectious disease go down. No hepatitis or HIV because the needles are unexchangeable. Number three, economy. The black market died. Think of the, how much of the black market will actually benefit when the cannabis really legalized. You have watched for that. And I've got that evidence. I've got two cases admitted in the Stellenbosch. You know why? I'll tell you, this is what we see them. If I ask you, they said only 30% of people can see frog. How many of you can see the frog here? Okay, may I ask you, all of you, to just to tilt your head to the right, what do you see? How many of you see holes? This is exactly what is happening. It's a delusion. It's a tricky business. Someone is waiting, someone is waiting, someone is waiting for us to do the whole business so they can walk in and do the illegal business. And why? Here is the dreadful slide. Whether you like it or not. This is a synthetic THC. 
The K2 of the two cases admitted, young man, 21 years old, young lady, 21 years old, passed away. Severe catatonia. Catatonia means you get a muscle spasm. Why? Because THC at certain dose, at unexpected dose, it blocks the dopamine receptor. It's a receptor responsible for addiction and also for a muscle spasm. That's why Parkinson patient, they don't have that kind of the heavy gait and mask face because they have blocked the dopamine one. Because in the process of me making the THC as a chemical, they actually discounted that. They don't give you the THC. They give you a molecule that may resemble the THC. Your body is very smart, it will reject it. When you enter the code first and it's wrong, if you blip, you get two chances. You enter the game, you get one more chance. When you kill the third time wrongfully, you get blocked. And what happened as a what you call the compensatory feedback mechanism, the body will start releasing dopamine, causing severe catatonia. Catatonia means all the muscles, including the small muscle in your trachea, will get spasm and you will die because of suffocation. This is, this is coming in South Africa. There's two cases important from America. This is what they're in the market. They use all of these fancy things, scooby doos stuff like that, how this is the kind of trick. Unless someone with a re really clear and concise documentation, the synthetic, what they call the counterfeit medication, could have can be the next nightmare. And that's when more stigma is going to happen to the cannabis society. What do we need to know? Rule number one. Everyone must admit that, do we know everything? No. And I think, no, it means in a very positive side. There is lots of clear evidence that cannabis could have provide more evidence that will support the health, health, wellness and healthness than what we expect. Do we have pharmacologically active substances? Yes. At least we can go now with the CBG, talking about the CBDA and THC and acid, and we can break down the system. Research and preclinical needed? Definitely yes. We have to look at toxicology studies, we have to look at receptor study, we have to identify. Before you can bring drug from the lab to the humans, you have to have at least a toxic dose of nowhere. Without that, you can't start a clinical trial. Now, the long-term study needed, definitely yes, because what happened, if I'm using that, I'm not about smoking, but the medical cannabis comes to the market, safety must be preserved. Population study needed, yes. Talks about pharmacogenetics, different population from South Africa, from Europe, from America. We need to look at that. We need to look at the pharmacovigilance. It's a sign of studying adverse drug reaction. Like how I heard about the K2 if that case hadn't been reported. Now, what about pharmacogenomics? Again, we have lots of flaring signs you can actually identify if this person needed 20 to 75 milligrams of CBD or just 500 milligrams of CBD. Interaction study is needed because if I'm taking my digoxin for the heart or I'm taking my ARV for HIV, is there any chance for this CBD to interfere with my medication? That's called safety precautions. We need to understand that. Everyone has been told when you fly to Cape Town, switch off your phone. We knew that the navigation system would never be effective. There's actually, if you look at those guys, they're called the Mythbusters. They did that. They actually used the high frequency Bluetooth of a mega device and the navigation system never even move an inch. But there's a safety precaution, we understand that. The level of access, evidence-based, not evidence-biased. Because there's a huge difference. Evidence-based when you want to seek the truth. Evidence-biased when you have an, an idea and you want to confirm that your idea is the ultimate truth. And that's from where extremism comes from. We always talk about extremism in religion, in culture. There's an academic extremism that we need to be worried about. Thank you so much. For that. <laughs>